Claudia Wentworth, take one. Yeah, I've got quite a... As I said, my, my, my primary goal is to do a, a, an advertising documentary, but it opens up into the media, and I think you have a really good story to tell, and you also have known, been around know a few people. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> so, uh, um, the, um, let me just, uh, Dave, let me, um, you got a good sound check? I got a good sound check, and let me set focus, and we'll be ready. All right. Camera trolling. You look beautiful. Oh, no. I told him the, the conversation doesn't matter. Is that camera? And what no 85-year-old woman wants to be on camera? <laughs> I would have never guessed you'd be 85. 86 this year. Oh, wow. Mm. Um, as a publisher, what do you like about telling a, an advertiser's story? And, and why is that part of the, the trust that you have as, as part of the media? An advertiser's story? Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, it's very important if, if there isn't, the news is important, yeah. but also the ad is part of the story, of a com it's part of the heartbeat of the community. Actually, I never thought about it from an advertising perspective. That's the first time the que that question, you must be associated with advertising for yes, you to put it that way, because I've always been more uh, concerned about the news aspect of it and exactly what is expected or what should be the criteria of, of the black press. And uh, that was what has really charted my course through the NNPAs and the associations that uh, originally started off through. Because it varies widely, you know, exactly what is the, the purpose of the black press. And each of us has his, our individual you know, belief of or concept of what it is. And I think your question probably must be what's at most of them's forefront is the advertising part, but that was never mine. I were because I once I got into it and discovered the power of that press, that was so scary. And and that happened back in the early integration days here in Roanoke and we were having a little bit of problem back in the 50s. Uh, and um, so they brought a group in here to kind of, when I say they, I'm not, uh, I'm just generalizing, but a, a group was formed of out of town of blacks from different places, so. I don't know exactly how it was, how they were chosen or what, none of them were from here. And um, they had arranged to bring um, Abernathy in here to speak. And so he came to, to the Civic Center and he, uh, Noel Taylor was mayor at that time and brand new at it. So that Civic Center was full of thousands of people in there. And he came in and um, he was, first when the, when the mayor came to present him the key, he started off by saying, I'm gonna take this key and let all the black folks out of jail. And he just, actually, he, he just, started at the bottom and went down for me. <laughs> Everything, you know, I thought he was gonna give us some sort of encouraging message, but instead he he was b boasting about how much his suits cost and how he reads the menu from the left, didn't have to read it from the right. To, and he just kept saying things that had nothing to do to me to help us through this, whatever it is. And then um, when he, he wound up saying, uh, telling them, when, don't be ashamed to be on welfare and this kind of stuff. After talking, it just wasn't making sense to me. The whole thing just kept making me madder and madder <laughs> and madder. And by the, at the end of it, I was supposed to have gone to dinner with the, with the 
honored guest, you know, and they said, come on, Claudia, aren't you going? I said, I don't think so. <laughs> right then I was, I could see smoke coming out of me. <laughs> I was so mad at that message he delivered. And then I, I just walked the floors that night until I wrote it, and I've never written a controversial editorial. And I was new at this because it was, I had just started in 71 when Daddy had his wreck, so it must have been around 72 or something like that. Uh, but anyway, and I just shot off this fiery editorial about him. I was so mad, I, and I said, I know, no, they're gonna run me out of town because they were applauding everything he said. They were just loving it. I said, I, that's what made me even madder. And I don't even remember where the editorial is or what, but. I just said, I know they're going to run me out of town because I'm new here at this Tribune, you know, and didn't know the feel of anything. But instead, they turned on the group. And uh, they were calling them on the jobs and everything about that presentation that man made and everything. And that show, I couldn't believe it. Well, editorial would have that kind of a power, you know, when I was the only one I thought was insulted by it. So that kind of charted my course, that little incident. I said, my God, and I was trying to get rid of the paper to start with. Did not want any part of it because I was just helping Daddy. <laughs> and that meant helping him with the composition part, which was at that time was on the old liner type machine. And I couldn't learn with him because he didn't know that much about it. And so I left and went to work on papers in, well, in the New York Age, uh, Cleveland Herald, um, Ohio State Sentinel in uh, Columbus, and just different to learn how to operate that liner type machine and then come back and help him intermittently. It wasn't a long period. It was just no more than a year at, a, at any one place to come back. But it was always an old, dingy composition, hot lead, you know, in those days, all male, and I'm the only woman in there. So all of those things just, I, it was no future I was looking forward to, so the first thing I wanted to do was get rid of that thing until I found out the power of that little incident that, my goodness, that means whoever gets this paper has to have some discretion about what message they send out there if it's that powerful. And today, and so I said, I'll wait till I find somebody I can entrust with that kind of power. And today I'm still looking. <laughs> well, that's a great answer. Um, why do you think it's important for a community to have passionate, uh, articulate, creative people as, uh, to improve the quality of life? Why do, why, do you think, why do you think that's important to a community like Roanoke and all the neighborhoods within? It's important to any community, the world. I'm sorry, I've start again because I, I talked over you. Oh, that's okay. Um, I think that's very critical because I consider the media, any color media, any kind of media, all media to be the circulatory system to society, just like your arteries and veins are the circulatory system to the human body. That's what the media is to society. And if you pump poison through those veins and arteries, you're going to get a sick human being. And if you pump it through the media arteries, you're going to get a sick society, and that's what we're reaping because they're not concerned about uh, society itself. You're concerned about headlines. It has to bleed to lead and anything war or bad, that's what you're pumping out there. I don't know if it's, I used to think it was accidental, but I'm actually beginning to believe it's by well-calculated design because you can control hate and if you can get people hating and fighting each other, you can control that hate and turn it any way you want to. 
So I'm just learning a lot of getting my own different attitudes about this media and its importance. And when I see all it, and having come through this era that I've come through, which I feel is the most strategic area in mankind's history, the last l little hundred years or so, because we've made more progress in that time than in all mankind put together. So uh, it's very important what this media is putting out there. Now look at the, what the difference in what that means. The media used to be, you know, in such a small, cover such a small area. Now look at all this media today. You push buttons and you contact in the whole world. You can start anything. An individual can start something through that mass media and, and what do you, social media and all of that. It is so scary to somebody my age to see how fragile our society is because it is so easily manipulated through hate and war and this kind of mentality. And that's what people appeal to when they want to control you. You impress me as a person of faith and an overwhelmingly positive person. Now, how do you square the fear with the hope in a case like that? You can't deal with the fear. <laughs> I just deal with the hope, and that's how I handle it, because uh, it's easy to spook people, but uh, when you deal with hope and faith, uh, you got to concentrate on that and, and whatever else, I mean, no matter, because you're going to be affected by whatever you concentrate on, so uh, it's, it's not that, uh, to me, hope is life, you know, you, you can take you through all kinds of things, and I've had from childhood had to go through all kinds of things, so I know that to dwell on unpleasant, it doesn't mean you minimize them, it just means you can't handle it. So you take what's going to help you and those around you to bring them out of it, you know, you can't lift when you're down. So that's how I've had to kind of positive, and I've use the sense of humor because I found that that helps a lot in things that people can't deal with. You put some humor to anything and you can make people laugh. That dispels fear, it dispels anxiety. When I have a horror of public speaking, have a horror of people actually. But when you start off with jokes or something that'll get to people in a laughing mood, then I feel a little more comfortable, but just getting up making a speech would terrify me. <laughs> um, <coughs> could, I, could I have you say, I'm sorry, could you, could, I like the statement where you said, I don't, I don't de deal with the fear, I deal with the hope. And can you just say that again, looking at Todd while I, I kind of move the camera in on you and stand by? This chair, I'll be back. And mm -hmm. action. Say that to yeah. Todd. yeah, just say I, I don't. I don't yeah. deal with fear. I deal with the yeah. hope. Which I think with what you said. Right. Yeah. I, I I don't deal with fear. I just mm -hmm. deal with hope because there's so many things both ways. To fear and hope is much stronger for me because it lifts. Fear, you know, kind of scatters you and panic. So um, I just deal with because I've always been in a position, somehow, not of my own choosing, to, inf everyone influences others, you know? Even if it's just within your own home or immediate surroundings, you influence others. And I've always tried to make a positive influence on those, and the worse the conditioning, the more you have to bring people out of it, you know? And, and that's the way I usually, gear my life and I've done it with a sense of humor because way back in the days of radio before <laughs> television Arthur Godfrey used to have uh, uh, Sam Levinson or something like that on his show and he used to always say teach your kids a sense of humor if you don't teach them anything else so I thought we came up in some potentially dismal 
things that you could really spook children and anybody else about. <coughs> so I took that lesson and we just learned to laugh about things that we couldn't handle or whether we could handle it. And I kind of OD'd with that. My kids all got, they don't take anything <laughs> seriously anymore. <laughs> but it, it helps uh, when you're happy and you can make others happy and laugh. And it, that kind of forms its own little personality. My son, everybody loves my son because he's got this sense of humor and he, everybody's baby and he's just loving everybody, you know, regardless of how fearful or what's inside of him. You think he hadn't got a care in the world. So it, it, it has worked on all three of my kids. They're all very admirable, humorous, just quick-witted kids. <laughs> Tell me about how the Tribune got its start, how you came to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, um, how you came to be a part of it, and, and just a, a, a just a, a, a snippet kind of thing. And I'd also be interested. You you told me about how the archives had been destroyed. Yes. I, I, I didn't. I never heard about that. <laughs> well, very few people have, <laughs> except when they, somebody interviews me, and that usually gets left out of the interview. <laughs> but it started, <clears throat> well, our family lived in Lynchburg when, um, well, when uh, Daddy started into the ministry there, and uh, he got a call to pastor the First Memorial Baptist Church of Cambria, Virginia, which now is Christiansburg, and that was in 1935. So when he accepted that and went there, uh, I had just uh, finished the second grade in Lynchburg. I was eight years old. I went into the entered into the third grade and but it was a Quaker school we didn't have any public schools up there then because um, that ended with Roanoke County uh, no public schools up in up in black in the Montgomery County for blacks so uh, the Quakers had built the church and the school and the high school, Christiansburg Institute, all of that's Quaker because there was no schools up in that area for us. So I entered into the third grade at Hill School in Christiansburg. And while during Daddy's pastorate there, he was there for 14 years, he changed the name from First Memorial to Schaefer Memorial Baptist Church, and that's what it remains today. But that's not in any history either because they refused to put it there. So it's, uh, but we have where he was installed by Vernon Johns, who was not popular in those days, but has since become. He was from Bedford and they were very close friends. He uh, did his installation service at First Memorial Church of Cambria. And now it's Christian, it's Schaefer Memorial Baptist Church, but nobody says how that happened. <laughs> but then he, after he started, after he was there for a few years, we went in 35, and about four years later, he, he wanted, he was in the printing business to start with, he, before he was in the ministry. He was a printer at um, Lynchburg, um, seminary down there. He was teaching printing and this kind of thing. So when he went up there, he just had this, uh, he's always wanted and been involved with newspapers, other newspapers back in those days. So he came down to Roanoke to start his own in 39. And that's when he got all the official things together that we, when we say we were making uh, of course, Will Creasy and I, I came up with this uh, motto of making and recording black history since 1939. So some people, the actual first issue didn't roll off the press when we went down there and opened the door. So we didn't 
that didn't come until 41. But all of the preliminary part, getting the place, getting everything organized, it took us from 39 to 41 to actually start rolling it off of the press on a regular basis. So that's where there may be a discrepancy when somebody says that. The Virginia Library, uh, state libraries, they have more copies of our papers than we ever had because they pretty much have a glossary of it. And because we got all ours destroyed, what we did have when the, during the quote unquote redevelopment of Henry Street <laughs> in that area, Gainsborough area, quite controversial. And so everything got destroyed up in there. Uh, can you cut this a little bit? Because, I mean, the, the sound part? Because I want to know how, how fact, we need to talk. <laughs> sure, sure. I, I mean, we're going to be. Because, uh, you see, this is a situation that's, very touchy because integrations in the city and, and all of this kind of stuff and how, and I just don't know how much history and how you want it. I, I'm interested in it. I, it. It will probably not be in the actual documentary, but honestly, I'm, I'm just interested. Part of, part, all of what we're going to do will be preserved. Uh, uh, the, right. The, and and part, of my, part of my goal here is to get the stories on, on record. Now that doesn't mean, I'm hoping to get a very nice little neat hour package that is right. actual history. But everything's going be, to be... Because preserved. history's not always pretty. No. And no. real truth, you know. And, and this is what, uh, when people ask me about history, I don't know how to dance through that. Because uh, this city does not have a good... Uh, integration history, but it's no record of anything anywhere. And, and our place is, is just one of the many, many uh, incidences of it uh, where they, in, in the history of uh, Roanoke, in all of its demolition and everything, not a single black business has ever gotten a dime to relocate through the whole thing. And I was just happened to be kind of at the end of the line, and I, nobody knew it and, and, or even questioned it because they had called me to come when that redevelopment was upstairs right down here on 12th Street back in the 70s, it was. Back in the late 70s to borrow money. They got every black business to borrow money and move themselves out of it. And they gave a couple of churches some money, but no black business. So they asked my husband, they called me to come to talk with them upstairs down here on 12th Street and uh, to talk me into borrowing money and moving the Tribune off of Henry Street. I said, I'm not thinking about borrowing any money to move off of Henry Street. And uh, he says, <coughs> well, I, kept dancing around and he said, well, we can't move any media. We moved a printing company off of, from downtown. We had to send people, get people from Japan to help us with this stuff. And uh, anyway, um, I just said, um, don't you get assist, don't you, you know, allow, um, doesn't the government allow for relocation? He says, only if we designated a target area, and we have no intentions of designating your area, a target, your place, a target area. And, uh, and I said, furthermore, I couldn't borrow money if I wanted to, because the media couldn't borrow from S, uh, SBA, because I had tried that when Daddy had his car wreck, and, and went out in the paper shut down because uh, I didn't know how to get it out by myself while he was in the hospital, but it was just a couple of weeks until uh, I had to make arrangements with him to buy it. He wouldn't let me come into place unless I bought it from him. And so I, I see it's a very convoluted story. It's just not all roses. And uh, 
So I told them I couldn't borrow SPA money if I wanted to, and they didn't know that. And he said, well, you do job work, don't you? I said, yes. He said, well, you can borrow it on that. I said, I don't want to, and I don't intend to. And he says, well, I'm going to tell you to your face. We're not going to give you a dime. I said, well, we'll just see. And I waited, and the uh, next thing I knew, we came out of there one afternoon. My husband and we go went home, and the phone was ringing. Tribune was on fire. So I go rushing back down there, and the whole the Star City, we were up under the Star City, it, they had firebombed the place. So you see, it's a lot of history that I don't talk about because it's going to get cut out of everything and in whatever uh but that's the history so i just want to know how, what you want me to say you want me to give you the pretty history about the tribune it ain't pretty <laughs> uh i'm just tenacious that's all the more obstacles i have born in obstacles and i have been the one that had to overcome them and help everybody else hurdle them and at 86, it still fuels me. You throw me an obstacle, I'm going to show you I can handle it. <laughs> and that's just my nature. And so now we'll get back on track with wherever you want me to start with, with this uh, other. Because after they did that, I still didn't miss an issue because I was on that line of type where the water was all downstairs. We were underneath the Star City. I just pulled those old wires up out the water and kept setting out to <laughs> And we never missed the issue, but when they bulldozed me, that was months later. It may even have been a year later. They bulldozed me in 83, so it must have been several years later when they actually bulldozed me. And um, I was doing work for them. Uh, they had a pack something they call a pack that they funnel their monies through for this area. And uh, I would, used to do that notarization for them, and they called me that evening. I always worked late because I had to do everything myself down there. And they asked me to come notarize some stuff for them, and I did, and we were over there talking. And uh, they were talking about demolishing the Star City. I said, now, don't forget, I'm up under there. And he said, oh, you know we're going to take care of you. We're not going to hurt you. Next morning, my phone rings. said, do you know they bulldozed the Tribune last night? Oh, with air, and I go down there, and the whole everything is in a pile of rubble. So I go running down to this city to try to stop it, although everything was down by then. And they said, oh, they didn't know I was still up under there. But by then, I had uh, gotten my dad out to the hospital. They had cut his leg off, and I had him at home in a room. And I couldn't afford to pay somebody to stay with him while I was on Henry Street sitting on that line of type. So I had a friend of my husband's had talked me into buying what you call a photo setter. It looked something like this, about that size, but it took pictures of every line, and I had set it in my dad's room at home so I could set the paper at home and not stay down at Henry Street all night by myself setting it. So it, that was why I didn't have to set it on, when they bulldozed it, I was setting it at home then. So I still didn't miss an issue. I just kept going. But I lost everything when they bulldozed, except what you see up there, which the little blue one that survived the fire. When that was the only thing I saved when when they watered, and uh, then the other start with uh, with eighty three, because that's when they bulldozed it in eighty three and destroyed everything else, all of our records, all of our files, all of Roanoke's black history, because since 1941 and everything, so all we got now is what you see there on the shelf. But uh, the more I, um, once I discovered the power of it and observed what other people, how other people handle that power, it just made me more determined to hang in there 
and put more positive messages out there. And I was blessed to be able to do that because in 1971 was when Daddy had his accident and I came in in August. That was, it was 4th of July and I started it in August. It took me about four weeks to do all the paperwork and get so I could come in there and keep it going. So we missed about four issues right in through there in 71 before I took it and started it. And in 72, uh, a little white-haired white lady from South Carolina and her husband, who was from Venton, walked through Henry Street uh, with street teaching and about the Baha'i faith. And she asked me, had I ever heard of Bahá'u'lláh? I said, no, and I don't want to hear about it, just like that. <laughs> and she just was so sweet and ignored everything. She said, don't you believe in love and justice? I said, doesn't everybody? I was so impressed at how she was handling my rudeness till I just said, well, give me something to read or something. And she gave me a little pamphlet, and I, and I took it home and read it with my husband, and it, the first paragraph said that the Baha'i Faith was a new, universal, independent religion whose aim is to revitalize mankind spiritually, to break down the barriers between all peoples, and to simply lay the foundation of a world society based on two pillars, justice and love. I said, Lord, that's beautiful. I want to know more about that. So I, there was nobody here to teach me, but anyway, once I found someone in Roanoke County, and she was a Persian lady, and I, all of the messages were so beautiful, so positive, and so worldwide, so different from other religions, and I'd been in Daddy's church or somebody's church all my life since, since I was born, never missed a Sunday in church, but this just was something absolutely new and beautiful and more encompassing than individual segments of one religion kind of a thing. So the more I got into that, the more I kind of felt the, uh, how it came at a time to help me do what I believed in doing but had no idea how to do. And so this is really what inspires me through this press because I not only learned about it, I have a media through which I can pump healthy stuff instead of poison. I don't, I don't teach the Baha'i faith in it because it's a Bible belt, but I just do the principles, which is the principles of all religion. And I give for credit where whatever I quote, whether it's from the Bible or from uh, uh, St. Francis, or any of the philosophers. And, but it's so much beauty in this world that we are just, with the smarter mankind gets technologically and scientifically, the more dangerous they're because they're putting it all in war. They're putting it all in war. And now this it's just really scary. Uh, and all of that is predicated upon hate. You can't have war if everybody loves each other. So uh, I learned that just, you'll be here all day with me. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that when I went to SAC Air Force Command with Lynn Holton when he was governor. And uh, I had my kids were in high school then and, and in the ROTC. And of course, you've got your pride, your, your national pride, and whatever it is you come up with, whether it's prejudicial pride or racial, whatever. Whatever you come up in, that's what you're a product of. But then when I got over there, and we, uh, it was during, similar to now, when uh, the governments were switching their focus m less on war and more on social programs and things like that, which Obama's been proposing, you know, and, and kind of de-escalating war, but that got unpopular with the people who saying, you're weakening our military. So, you really don't know how, but anyway, when we went over there, it was 20 people. Each governor was being invited during that era when Nixon was in the White House to come 
and uh, bring 20 people from throughout your state, anybody you want with you. And they took us through a weekend uh, crash course of, uh, what do you call it, when you take your uh, six weeks training that you come into the service, they give you this six boot camp. boot camp, that's what it is. So they took us through a crash course of that to, to, and before telling us the purpose of why we had come out there and that was to the governor and to promote, get the president and Congress to put more money back into the military and war and less into the social programs and that's kind of where it's we're circled right back to that right now. Let me ask you, you've, been, you, you've seen a lot of things in, in Roanoke, and you're, positive, and you're focused on the positive. What are the good things, the good changes that you can see that the media, the advertising community, the creative community join on, like, I don't know, Festival in the Park, the Henry Street Festival, Center in the Square maybe, so stuff like that. What can you think of that that rallied the whole community together. To me. Uh, saving a hotel room it was a good thing. The, the One name, Pearl Fu. Pearl Fu has brought this valley together more so than anybody I anywhere. And we've had other states who have sent people in here to see how Pearl Fu did it. And it's it's very personal to me because I met Pearl Fu before, she, before Local Colors. And uh, I was on the board of the Mill Mountain Playhouse and um, Science Museum both before they even went to Center in the Square. So, and once the Mill Mountain Playhouse went down into uh, the Center in the Square, they were having some, uh, they couldn't get the people, the, in fact they weren't getting the audiences that they were getting, hoping for, and so they would plan a, a little thing brown on Church Street to uh, show them the mechanics of, of uh, stage uh, live productions. And uh, they had planned this big little reception and everything, and Pearl Poo and I were about the only ones who came. I was on the board and Pearl was a volunteer at that time. So we just sat around and talked. I think we got once we got to talk, and I don't really know how many people came, we got so engrossed in one another till we just got lost track. But she was telling me where she came from in China and just her little history and what she wanted to do, but it wasn't a local colors or anything, just talking, and why she had to leave, because where she came from, women couldn't talk, they wouldn't let women talk, and she's a talker, and she had to go where she could talk. But anyway, she got this little notion about doing something on a small scale, this nation, this local colors things. That actually leads me into another thing I'd be curious about. Um, in the, the, the media in particular, Roanoke, I think we can all agree, is, is certainly a typical town, probably a typical southern town. It, has it no is. It has history, but other than that. Absolutely. But you have women in Roanoke who were doing big things at a time that women in New York City were still caught in uh, in secretarial pools and weren't being listened to. I, I, I look at you. I look at Mamie Bass, who, who, is, who was pretty influential in, in, in the Republican Party. Claire, Mad Claire Maddox was running an ad agency at a time no women were running ad agencies. How do you think that uh, uh, Julie McDowell, I, I'm sure you knew Julie, uh, she worked for John Will, but she mm -hmm. was a wonderful designer a, a, and a lead creative at a time that most women but were But nobody's creative. ever heard of any of them, <laughs> except those who work with us. You see, you are familiar with these names, nobody else is, because that, and well, that brings us to a different sort of of um, of segregation or whatever the attitude is, and that's the male female thing. You know, the uh, uh, men are just threatened by women, and they are mostly in power. See, you you don't notice that when you are a man, but if you're a woman on any job, and you know that's a fact because. I mean, women suffered, you know, they didn't want them to vote. It, it, women have always been. 
I'm going to give you a copy of my my editorial, Father's Day editorial, to put a different... I put a. I try to put a broader perspective on things. We most dearly deal with just a little uh, right immediate. You know, our own little little squares. We deal in our own little cubicles, and um, news, even national news, is just in little cubicles of the here and the now or what, or somebody's version, and it's gotten so opinionated. That's what I resent in news. It's actually coming in opinionated, you know. It's not news. And even putting the uh, the uh, newscasters, are putting their spin to it after something. They'll put a little something behind it, if that's so, or whatever. And it's, it just blows my mind that you're not giving news impartially. You're putting a slant to it to, to influence people to see it your way kind of a thing. And it's just so obvious that I just almost turn it off almost every day. I have to turn it off because you are swaying, trying to give people a, a perspect your perspective of whatever this is in the news. And it's, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Tell me about relationship. Tell me about, uh, for people who don't know him, and, and he's been gone 15 years now, there's a lot of people who don't know him. Tell me about John Will Creasy and why he was a special man. And start out with John Will Creasy was, because my voice isn't going to be part of this, if you don't mind. I didn't know him personally. I only came in contact with him through my media. You know, if I, I, I don't know where we met well, we we would meet a lot most people I met on different committees boards through this kind of thing I don't even know exactly when or how I met John Will but I just know he was such a gentleman and so polite and different from other people and how he came to help me with the tr I don't know if I called and asked him to help me with a logo or something with my newspaper but if you call John Will for anything, he's there. So I really don't actually know how our association began. It's just through us, our common, you know, circles that I'm sure we kept meeting, and he just has this tender, uh, different way about him. He's not just a businessman, he's more like a a father or somebody, it's a little deeper, whatever it was he had. And it didn't seem to come from a color line, you know, it's just a feeling you have around people who are, who love people, who love circumstances that they can have something to, and that was the feeling I got from him and it turned out to be so. And he, I, I remember the longest personal contact I had with him was when I asked him, to help me to form a logo, you know, from a newspaper. And he came up with this little thing right here, which I didn't understand. <laughs> that's, that's John Wilkes. And he said that was represented the, the, sh the short uh, beginning of our paper. And this was the bigger, broader path that we would be taking. And I, I never thought of that. Uh, and so I said, okay, I've seen that since once. Somebody else used that. Now, I don't know what, where that, I only saw it one time, and I don't remember where I saw it, that it wasn't associated with the Tribune, but we didn't uh, get it, what do you call it, uh, when it's yours only. Um, copyright or Cop trademark. Yeah, trademark. trademark, copyright. We didn't do that. We He just did it, and I never legalized it so if someone else used it they could but I'd never seen it before nor since until not too long ago when I when I uh, saw it somebody just one time and I don't remember how it was but he helped me with that and uh, we couldn't come up with a uh, he said a logo uh, um, a little catchy phrase and I came I said what about making and recording black history since 1939? He said, that's good. I like that. So he did that, and I did that, and we kind of put together. And that's the only time I remember ever spending any time with him, just us, you know, is when we were working on this logo. 
but we just had, were meeting in other on other occasions, just casual. And I don't even remember having a conversation with him anywhere else. <laughs> so we weren't really friends or anything. He was just, I just admired him, and apparently he did some part of me to have offered to help me, you know, as, as he did. One last question. Um, what makes you optimistic <clears throat> about, about the future for the paper, for the community, for, our, for my kids, for your grandkids? Well, we're back to, to bringing me into this space, which is all not just optimism, but to me it's, it's, it's like the GPS to attaining everything that's right in here, that's put here for us, that we're all gotten caught up in using for the wrong reasons. And it's, it's just different from anything else. The timing of it is different to, to accommodate a different maturity of mankind, and it's, it just makes sense to me, and it has certainly worked for me because I embraced it one year after, I, in 73, after I got the Tribune, and ever since then, that path I've been following has just done miracles, because all I was gonna do was get rid of this paper as soon as I could, and when I realized the power of it, and I just said, well, actually, I have a bigger congregation here that I can pump healthy serum through the veins and I'll just continue to do that on whatever little small drops that I can do and it, it just and I've had it now since what 72 since so how many years 40 um, and it's it's getting more and it's having more and more positive effect on people if all races all religions are are being inspired by writing just the editors. People say, I, I just read it for those editors to try to give people a broader, more uh, encouraging perspective of things. You know, it's, it's not what we're going through, it's how we take what we're going through and how we handle it kind of a thing. And it's just general encouragement for people not to get sunk in, in the here and the now because people can control you down there and wi you'll wipe yourself out. <laughs>